very well, did they? Give them a hand. That was awesome. That was awesome. That was good. Thank you. That was, uh, as, as the families were up here and I was down there praying and, and many of you were seated there and I looked up in the choir and saw all these men. And, and, and let's just be real honest this morning. I heard a long time ago this statement, um, and I wasn't thinking about sharing this, so maybe I'll remember, but as, as goes the man, so goes the home. And as goes the home, so goes the church. And as goes the church, so goes the community. And as goes the community, so goes a nation. And so when you back that up and unpack that, the reality of where our culture is today, who is to blame for that? It's, it's us, it's us men, because we have not led our homes well. We have not led our churches well. We have not led our communities well. And so as I was praying and I looked up and I saw this, uh, I don't know, 100 plus men and, and these families, I thought, what, what could happen in this church? What could happen in this community if us as individuals and us as men and us as leaders really led our homes and our churches to know and follow Jesus? Amen. Would it change this place? Amen. Would there be power in this place? Amen. Yes. And so I want to, for those of you men, uh, I know Ish and Adam and several of those guys have been working really hard to get the men's ministry going again, and I want to say thank you to them. Uh, because every, the church, and, and this is no slight to anyone else, but the church is only going to be as powerful and as strong as the men of that church are. And if we will learn and, and model how to know and follow Jesus, then, then everyone else will follow suit. And so, men, it's on us. Can I get an amen from you, men? Um, Mother's Day, we always have a nice, cute message for moms, and it seems like Father's Day, I always just want to rail on you dads, all right? So I'm going to rail in the love of God this morning. No, I hope I will encourage you. So we, we put up on, or I put up on Facebook the other day, so uh, thank you to all you ladies who got the donuts ready and, and uh, served us donuts this morning. How many of you uh, enjoyed a few donuts? Um, I actually didn't, and I'm hoping there's some left afterwards, but anyways... Um, we, uh, as, as we were preparing for that, I, we had a bunch of ties, and, and Jamie uh, Bacon did those tie back there for us in the photo booth, I think, for that. But um, I had this collection of ties on my, t- my table there in my office, and so I took two pictures. Uh, one, and, and so let's show that picture real quick. And I put it on Facebook. Some of you voted. Some of you right. Some of you wrong. And so I asked the question, which ones belong to me? Which side belongs to me? Which side belongs to Pastor Dave? So we're going we're gonna to take a vote in here this morning because not everybody's on social media. How many of you think that, that A, those ties there belong to me? Raise your hand. A, if you think A belongs to me, raise your hand. All right, so if you think A belongs to David, Pastor Dave, would you raise your hand? All right, I'm... Wow. Was that about 50-50? It looked more like 60-40, like 60% think A is for Dave. Is that, is that the, let's, let's do it again. If you think A belongs to me, raise your hand. All right. If you think A, uh, A belongs to Dave, Pastor Dave, raise your hand. Wow. Some of you voted twice. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. We're, we're going to split. We have a split church. It's a good Baptist church, 50-50, right? So. The answer is, so half of you walk away good today, right? So I was looking at some of those ties. Now, my, my dad, who I call Pastor Haley, most of you call Pastor Haley, he has this nice tie rack in his closet. I think it may, maybe even like powered where you could push a button and they just turn. How many of you got one of those? All right. I told uh, someone a couple weeks ago how I store my ties, and they could not believe me. They thought I was lying to them. Mine are in a Walmart plastic bag. (laughs) Just thrown in there. And I remember throwing them in there when I moved to Kansas eight years ago, and they stayed in that bag. They're really secure in that bag. So anyway, so as I was getting them out, I'm like, man, some of these ties are 20 years old. 
old, old ties. But So how many of you were right? You feel good about your, your choice you made, all right? That's about half of you. The rest of you can boo them, all right? So turn to Luke chapter number 8. Luke chapter number 8 this morning. And we're going to talk about a dad who... We're going to look at three things this morning. So if you have your bulletin, I would encourage you to get out and take some notes. And I'm going to speak to really all of us, but it's kind of directed to us men because it's about a man. It's about a man, a man named Jairus. And Jairus had one daughter, an only daughter. And his daughter was 12 years old, as we're going to read in this story. And, and we're going to see a pattern here that I think that we as men and we as families can, can model on how... So if you've, if you've been tracking with us this morning, you kind of ca- caught a theme here is... How can we teach our families, our children, to know and follow Jesus? And I think there's three things that Jairus, or Jairus, excuse me, did in this story that we can we can pattern. So let's read the story, and then uh, we'll get into it. All right. So Luke chapter eight, verse number forty. So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting. Behold, there came a man named Jairus. He was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. And so we'll pause for a moment just for some information here that if he's a ruler in the synagogue, for him to go to Jesus, Matthew references this same passage here that he worshipped at the feet of Jesus. For, for the leader in a synagogue to seek out Jesus' help was not normal. Okay, Because the leaders in the synagogues are the one that's going to eventually kill Jesus. So he's going against his religion, he's going against his bosses, he's going against culture to pursue Jesus. This is not normal, okay? And so as a ruler in the synagogue, he is pursuing Jesus, he humbles himself, he falls down at Jesus' feet. Verse number 42, for he had an only daughter about 12 years of age. She was dying, but he went to the multitudes, but as he went, the multitudes thronged him. So what happens here? He falls at Jesus' feet. You've got to come to my house. My daughter, she's almost 12 or around 12. She's about to die. Jesus, you're the only one that can save her. And so that verse is, as he went, and as he is referencing Jesus, as Jesus is going with Jairus to go to the daughter to the house to heal her, verse 43 happens. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years. And I don't really didn't do a lot of studies on the numbers or if there's any correlation here. It's just interesting to point out his daughter's 12 years of age. Now this lady who's been sick for 12 years approaches Jesus who had, had spent all her livelihood on physicians. She's been to doctor after doctor. Verse 43, and she could not be healed by any, no doctor or of any help. Verse 44, come, come from behind and touch the border of Jesus' garment. And immediately her flow of blood was stopped or she was healed. Verse 45, she said, now Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitude's throng and press you. And you say, who touched me? Like, how would we even know? Verse 46, but Jesus said, somebody touched me, for I perceived power going out from me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down. I mean, she was like, uh-oh, Jesus spotted me, right? And she, and she says, declared to him in the presence of all the people and the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. Now, I've never heard any much commentary on this or even read much commentary on this, but I like to think things a little differently. Now, if you are Jairus and you're the dad and your daughter is home almost about to die, she's 12 years of age and you've done everything, you've gone against culture, you've stepped out on faith, you're pursuing this man called Jesus, and he, you've convinced Jesus to come to your house and you know that Jesus is powerful enough to heal your daughter, but she's almost going to die. And this lady stops the crowd from going to his house. How many of you would be a little bit upset about that to that lady? How many of you might have had some words with that lady? Okay. You you can raise your hand. I see you wanting to raise your hand. All right. I'm thinking we're going to have some words. Right. And and maybe they did. I don't know. It doesn't mention it here. But I, I, I can just imagine as a father, as a mother, have you ever been desperate for your kids? Have you ever been desperate enough to do anything? I, I, I see him Bart right here, and it just made me think of a story, Bart. Is it all right if I tell a story about you? All right, he, he's a big dude. i got to ask permission. And so Bart here, I remember when, when his oldest son, Hayden, was playing football at, at Crowley over here at the high school. And I think he was maybe eighth grade or something. And I went to watch the game, and Bart was, 
entertaining to watch. I'm trying to figure out. Bart may have been a little upset. And I remember Debbie coming over to me. This is several years back. And Debbie goes, just wait. You'll be a dad. You'll understand. And about eight years later, my son was playing football. And I was like, ah, I get it. I get it. You guys know what I'm talking about? It's just a side note. Let's continue reading, all right? Verse 49, while he was speaking, someone came to from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, so this lady has stopped Jesus from coming to this man's house. And she gets healed. But in, the, in this pause, someone from Jairus' house comes and says, don't bother Jesus, she already died. That would be bad, wouldn't it? Verse 50. But when Jesus heard it, he answered and said, Do not be afraid. Only what? Believe. Have faith. And she will be made well. Verse 51. When he came to the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John, and the other, and the father and the mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her. But he said, Jesus said, Do not weep. She's not dead, but sleeping. And I wish we could camp out on verse 43, 53, but we won't. He says, don't weep, she's sleeping. Verse 53, they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. It's not a good place to be when you ridiculed Jesus, all right? We'll just pause at that. Verse 54, but he put them all outside, which I would have too, took her by the hand and called, saying, little girl, arise. Then her spirit returned, and she arose immediately and commanded that she be given something to eat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Isn't it an amazing miracle that Jesus performed here? This man had faith that Jesus could heal his daughter if she hadn't passed away. Now he realizes not only does Jesus have the power to heal her sickness, but Jesus has the power to raise to life. That changes everything for us, doesn't it? Because Jesus has the power to bring the dead to life, we can have salvation. We can have eternal life because Jesus died on the cross for my sins, was buried and placed in the tomb. Three days later, he came back to life. Can you say amen to that? And because he has life, we also can have life. And so as a father, could you imagine how crazy you might have went in this moment? Like the football doesn't even compare to the fact that my daughter was dead and she is now alive. Before we get to the lessons of this man, though, go with me to Genesis chapter number 2. I'm going to ask my dad uh, to come up this morning, and he's going to help me preach part of the message this morning. A few months ago, I thought... How awesome is it that my dad here is a member of the church, and he could preach with me. And so this is going to be kind of a cool thing, I think. Uh, he, he's, sometimes I'm not sure what's going to happen when he gets on stage, but we'll, we'll roll with it, right? And so Genesis chapter number 2. And in Genesis chapter number 2, we're going to read just a couple verses. Verse 15, starting in verse number 15. I guess I should turn there since I told you to. Genesis 2, verse 15, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. All right, so you get where we're at. God has just created everything, and now he's created man, and he put him in the garden. Verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Verse 17 is an important verse, right? So God has created man. In the garden, you can eat of every tree, verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. Does that seem clear enough instructions? Yeah, pretty clear. You shall not eat, right? You know, I never, I never as a kid growing up did not follow the instructions. Amen. <laughs> Sometimes they weren't quite clear enough to follow, but... These are very clear. You shall not eat. Or, or it says, for in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Is that clear? Does everybody understand what God has told Adam? Amen. And who has God told this message to? Who has God told the responsibility, this rule, this law? Who has he given it to? Adam. All right. Thank you, Adam. Verse, look at verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. So has Eve been created yet? And yet the, the law is very clear, is it not? Who did God give the law to? Adam. So go over to, verse, to chapter number 3. In the first few verses of chapter 3, you see 
the serpent. Satan comes in the form of a serpent, and he is deceiving Eve. But look at verse number 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. Had God, had God told Eve, or did he tell Adam? Okay, just making sure you're tracking with me. So she ate. But look at the last part of verse number 6. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. What is this telling us? God told Adam, don't eat of the tree, right, or you will die. Satan comes to Eve and tempts Eve. And where is Adam why, why Satan is tempting Eve? What, what does it say? Where is he? With her. And what we see and what Adam did is honestly what we still see in men today. That we're passive. God has given us the responsibility to lead our homes. And we're just like Adam. We sit by and wait and see what's going to happen. I don't know what Adam was thinking. Well, God says he's going to die. I'll, maybe I'll get a new one. I don't know what he's thinking, right? <laughs> but men, the reason that our culture, our homes are the way they are is because like Adam, we're passive. And we're not leading our homes. Now, Again, as the theme today has been that we want to, to lead our homes to know and follow Jesus. And, and I, I was blessed. And I know that some of you, I, I'm very blessed because uh, I had that modeled by my dad. My wife had that modeled by her dad. My kids have had that modeled by their granddads. And not everyone has that, right? Not everybody has that. And their dad, I'll put that. And so I want to ask my dad to, to kind of start this outline for us today because... What I observed in him in these 44 years now that I've been alive is that I've never doubted that he loves Jesus. Yeah, give him a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. I always like to call him Pastor. <laughs> you know, uh, being a dad is a very uh, uh, special uh, treat and also a uh, uh, a grave responsibility. How many of you dads uh, have, have uh, a, a child who is a compliant child, who always does what you want them to do? Would you raise your hand? You always have? Okay. They're kind of rare. How many of you have defiant ch children uh, or a child? Okay. Okay. My heart goes out to you. We, I, and, and John was real nice and complimentary introducing me. I know I could tell a lot of stuff on him. <laughs> but he trying to be nice. <laughs> but uh, as he was talking, all these stories came up. The curse of being old is that you have too many stories. And, uh, but anyway, of all my kids, I had uh, uh, sometimes they were compliant, and uh, there was always one that was the most defiant. And... Uh, <laughs> So, I was, anyway, in, in the text, let's get the text right quick, okay, before I get carried away here. Uh, in, in Luke chapter number 8, as Pastor John read for us this passage, uh, I was, uh, I was uh, sparked to look at verse 41, and behold, there came a man named Jairus. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a man. He was a ruler. Uh, he was absolutely not like Adam. He was not passive. He was a man who led out. You see, when he came to Jesus, he knew. It wasn't by night. Remember, Nicodemus came by night. Uh, and, Nick, and, and, and the reason, because Nicodemus was also a ruler in the synagogue, and he would be ostracized, he would be criticized, but Jairus didn't care. He was a leader, and he was a man, and he said, my daughter is in need, and I'm going to go to the one that can help. And so he didn't send his wife. He didn't send a servant. 
and he didn't come by night. He came. He led. And so as men, we need to be men, and that means a man's a leader. A, ma a man sees what needs to be done. They have a, a, what we call, uh, Robert Lewis in his study, that actually Pastor John, when he was our youth pastor, led us through uh, the four faces of manhood, and uh, Robert Lewis did a series, and I, I remember sitting at the table, and some of our older guys older than me and then younger guys, and it was, a, it was one of the most outstanding studies. I've, I've, re, I've reacquainted myself with that study, but one of the faces of man, of a leader is a warrior, one who leads and one who is not afraid to fight. And, and so we find in the Scriptures there are several references to that. As Paul was talking to his son Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter number 6, he says in verse number 11, but thou, O man of God, flee these things. And he just uh, references, flee the love of money, free, uh, flee from greed and from lust and greediness and all of those things. They pierce your soul with many sorrows. But he said, you follow uh, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, patience, love, gentleness, and fight the good fight of faith. It reminds me of also, as Paul wrote to uh, the church of Ephesus, he says, I, I want you to be strong in the Lord. In Ephesians chapter uh, number 6, the Bible is very clear to say uh, in that passage of Scripture that men be strong in the Lord, brethren, in the power of his might, and put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For you see, in his day, as well as in our day, the devil seeks for men to be distracted and not to be intentional in their leadership. But I'm going to tell you, Jairus was intentional. And on your first point of the message, he, he took initiative and led physically. He saw the need of his daughter physically. And he said, I am, I am not going to leave this to mom. I'm going to leave this to a servant. I'm going to lead out here. And I know exactly where I need to be, go. Because, you see, Satan always is wanting to destroy what God has created. He created male and female and marriage and the home and the family and the church. And the devil is always out to destroy those things. Can I, can I get a witness there? Amen. He's still working to destroy marriages today more than ever. And so over the years, I've watched men in our congregation and in other congregations. I've watched men. It was such a blessing to watch the men come up today. And I just looked around, and I said, man, we, we got a lot of men. And, you know, when you recognize a godly leader and you recognize a godly man in a home who leads, he leads and he sees the needs of his family. But I've watched not only young men who led in their families and led. I've seen them, the young men at the ERs. I've seen them at the hospitals. I've watched them when the babies were born. And I've watched so many of those as Pastor John has done the same thing now. And, but through life and ministry, I've not only watched them stay attentive to their family when they're born, but through those education years and college years and when they find someone and they're counseling them and they're leading them physically and helping them understand marriage and helping them understand how to love their wife and how to, how to be a man for God. And, and then I watched them in the last stages when so many of the times uh, women outlive the man. But in many cases, I've watched the men care for their wife physically. In those last years, I've watched, for years, I've watched men sacrifice themselves in those last years to care for an ailing wife. I mean, you look around this congregation, and, and their names start coming up. I mean, I, I look out here, and I look at Chris Christian, and I recognize what a man he was, and John Martin as they minister to their wife. And I, I, remember, I remember the night when Jerry Harry lost his wife in, after surgery. I remember how he led his family. He recovered from that and has given him a wonderful uh, wife and a ministry since that. It's over 17 years now. And I, I've watched these men. i watched Brother Robert Singley as he sacrificed himself. You see, this is a man who leads, takes initiative. He takes on the whole armor of God and he leads in a very positive way. But 
But you see, he, Jairus, was a great leader. And he took initiative with his health of his daughter. But he, you know what he knew? He knew he couldn't do it by himself. The greatest leader recognizes there's somebody bigger. There's somebody greater. A great leader who puts on the armor of God recognizes this is the armor that's not mine. It's the armor of who? Of God. We recognize that we can't solve all the problems. We can't fix every deal that comes up. But we need the Lord. We need God. He's bigger than us. And the task of being a father is bigger than a great leader. It needs the help of God. I, I can remember growing up, one of the things Dad said to me. He said, son, I want you to learn by my mistakes. Dad wanted me to be a better dad than he was. And there have been many times when I've said to my sons, you're a better dad than your dad. And that's been what my prayer. My dad prayed that I would be a better dad than him, and I prayed for my boys they'd be a better dad than their dad. You know why? Because we all fail. We all stumble. We all get tired. We all get sidetracked. We all get our attention diverted. What do we get our attention diverted to? The things that we love. We love fishing and hunting and baseball and shooting. <laughs> I mean, how easy it is for a man to be diverted. Just look where we spend our money, and you can see where our diversion is. Uh-oh, man, that's, that's good. Okay, getting down where we live. And <laughs> let me get past that, okay? We all need the Lord. Amen. We all need God to help us. We all need the Lord to come in our lives and say, I need Him spiritually. And that leads us to point two. Pastor John, he was, not a, he was not ashamed of the spiritual needs of his own, of his own children. Will you, will you come and help us understand how we need to invite Jesus in our home? Yeah, the point two there is, is take initiative to lead spiritually. And I think the, the verse that what's on the screen here, Matthew 9, 18, says... Uh, this is a parallel passage, the same story, but it mentions a, a different word. It says, while he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came, speaking of Jairus, and he worshipped him. And, and what I see in our culture and in churches today is that I see men uh, not only passive to lead physically and be out in front and be a leader, but also even maybe more so is to lead spiritually. Um, when, when we read this text here, you see that that when he came, verse number 41, it says that he fell down and he begged him. And then verse uh, number 50, we already read this, but it said, Jesus told him, if you will believe, then she will be healed. She'll be brought back to life. The fact that she was brought back to life then tells us what? Mm. That Jairus believed. Amen. That he had faith spiritually that Jesus could change mm. his circumstances. That Jesus, when Jesus entered the story, when Jesus entered the home... Everything could change. And, and for us as men to lead spiritually, and we don't have time to read it this morning, but maybe you should write down this reference, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, what's known as the Shema, and the Jewish family would memorize the Shema. This is when they asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? He quoted the Shema, love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. He added to it, Leviticus 19, I think 16, that said, and love your neighbor as yourself. But every Jewish leader, Jairus would have known what the Shema was. And, and what we as men need to do is to lead our home spiritually. And what I think is that most of us, me included, oftentimes feel inadequate to do it. We don't know how to do it. It's hard to do. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Right? And so I would say in the, in the text it talks about four different times when you, when you rise, when you go to bed, on the way, on the way home. And so to me, what I, what I would say for us just as an encouragement for you as leaders and men, and men who are leading their homes, leading spiritually doesn't always mean that on every Tuesday night you're going to open up the Bible and have an hour worth of worship and praise and you're going to expound on a text. It may mean that for your home. 
and it could include that. But I would say, as I already mentioned this phrase, that most of the time, spirituality in your home is going to be caught more than it is taught. And if, if your family sees you every morning or every night or at some point you have a place where your Bible is open and you're reading and you're praying, and they see that it's important to you, that's how you can lead them spiritually. When you have teachable moments, right? There's always teachable moments at the dinner table or driving them to or from school or to and from football practice or whatever it might be. There's always going to be teachable moments. And how can I as a dad point every conversation that can be pointed back to Jesus? And if I'm not living it spiritually, I cannot pass what I don't possess, right? And so don't be scared, Lead, so this is one of the reasons, and, and I know that some of you, you walked in here this morning and you saw that it was family worship and you were not excited about that. I know. I know who you are. I know that you're out there. That's okay. And maybe that's my fault. Maybe the reason you feel negative about family worship is, is because I haven't explained it well enough to you. So let me take a moment to explain it to you. How often do your kids get to see you in church, open up your Bible, Get your bulletin out, follow the pastor, and read a text of Scripture. My guess is that many of you dads get up and leave before your kids ever get out of bed. And if you are, and I'm going to say if, if you are reading your Bible daily, my guess is your kids don't see it that often. And if you worship God in your car on your way to work, your kids probably aren't sitting next to you while you do that. The greatest thing you can do is teach your kids how to know and follow Jesus. One of the greatest ways that's already set in your schedule to do that is to sit in this church service to raise your hands and worship a God who created you. And for your kids, whether you think they're catching or not because they're talking so much, they are going to catch it. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I know it's a little inconvenient, and I don't care. It's more important for them to see you as a family worship together than anything else, Amen. it's way more valuable. So I apologize to you for not explaining it sooner. There's no reason for you. You know, there are people that walk into this church, they see it's family worship, and they leave. Now, if your kid's like me as a kid, I mean, I get it. I understand. You don't want to sit and wrestle them in church because that's what it feels like. I get it. But trust me, it's important. It's important for them to see you open up your Bible Take some notes, say amen, and worship your creator. Amen. You think, do you think that's amen. important for your kid to see that? Amen. I, I do. Lead them spiritually. The third one is, is lead. This is probably the toughest for us men in the room, is to lead emotionally. It says in the text there that he fell on his face and he worshiped and he begged. Now, I'm going to give you a resource here. We don't have time to discuss it, but I want you to look it up, and it's called the five love languages. Okay, the five love languages, I mean, they have it for everything, for your dog probably, for your teenagers, for your spouse, the five love languages of your children by Gary Chapman, and I want to encourage you to look it up and read it, okay? If, if you want to invest in your kids, then read the book, okay? We read this many years ago, and, and for our kids, it's, their love language really hasn't changed. For Blake, his love language was always and has always been quality time. Like, he was always wanting to be right next to me, like, dude, leave me alone, you know, but but it made it easy for me, for him to feel loved, because he just always wanted to be with me. And I got to just hang out. You know, playing PlayStation was, was expressing love to him. So as a four-year-old, I convinced him to ask Santa Claus for a PlayStation. God is, God is good. Uh, my daughter Blair, hers is gifts. Like when I give her something, and we realized that when she was really young, she could go in her bedroom and she could point out, well, Grandma, Grammy gave me this, Mimi gave me this, Papa gave me that. And she, she had it all on her shelf everywhere, and she knew exactly who and when gave it to her. Now, I know some of you, all you meant that, yeah, every, every woman's gift is, uh, is uh, gifts, right, if I can give them something. That's not always the case, okay? My love language is words of affirmation. Just tell me how good I am. Can you, can you guys say, you guys are good. John, you're good. Can you say that? See, I feel so loved by you right now. <laughs> so loved. And, and my wife's is uh, acts of service. Okay, so, you know, I, th I think I'm telling her I love her by just telling her how awesome she is all the time. And it's not, I mean, it's nice, but it's not really, she doesn't feel loved. She wants me to do the dishes. <laughs> Vacuum. 
Joy, you're awesome. All right. <laughs> Meanwhile, she's, she's serving me because that's her love language. And I just want her to tell me, I'm awesome. You, you, are you tracking with me? Lead emotionally. But there's another layer to that. This uh, idea of emotionally. Because you need to study your kids. You need to know and, and you need to invest in time to, to know that. But the second aspect of that, I think, is, is part of this emotion is what are you passionate about? My, my kids, um, both of them, if you were to ask them who their favorite um, college basketball team is, do you know what they're going to tell you? KU. KU, you guys know, because I'm passionate about it. I'm yeah. passionate about the Jayhawks, and I got to take them to Fog Allen several years back, and it's like the the greatest college venue ever, all right? You're not going to argue with me because you're not going to win, all right? But we as a family went, and why, why, especially my daughter, she's not really a basketball fan, but why does she, like, why does she wear Kansas Jayhawk basketball stuff? Because I do, and I'm cool, right? <laughs> well, when she was 12, I was, not so much now. <laughs> what, does that teach, what does that teach us? It's caught more than it's taught. And, and I'm, I'm wondering, dads, moms, are you passionate about knowing and following Jesus? Because if you're not passionate about knowing and following Jesus, you're doing a disservice to your family. It's going to be much more difficult for them to know and follow Jesus. If you're passionate about it, there's a greater chance that they're going to be passionate about it. Can, and as Pastor Haley already mentioned, guys, we, we get passionate about a lot of things. But for some reason, God and church it just seems difficult. And, and so I want to just challenge you this morning to realize that you, you can't pass what you don't possess. The, the last part on your outline this morning, just this action step. Lead your family to know and follow Jesus. Lead them physically, lead them spiritually, lead them emotionally. And, and I've asked my dad if he would this morning just come and, and give us this kind of a final challenge and encouragement this morning. Pastor? Leading is uh, always a challenge. We lead physically in the needs, the physical needs of our family, the spiritual needs. But then we, we recognize that's the compassionate side of every man. We need to understand their feelings. Men, it's so important for you to listen to your godly wife about the needs of your kids. They pick up so much more than we do. You'll learn from your wife. You'll listen to her. Can I get an amen from the ladies? Amen. amen. They understand the needs of the kids better than you, but if you listen to them, if you will understand what they understand, by their example, follow their lead, because then they see the compassion of Dad. That he is sensitive to their feelings. And um, to do all this, a big job. It's a big task. And I don't know how many of you guys have been overcome by that. You know, there have been times in my life when I just wanted to pack up and run as far as I could run. You know, there have been moments when I just said, I'm done. I'm spent. I'm not going any farther. And you know, and something happens, the Lord intervenes. He gets a hold of your heart. And, you know, it's, it's those times that what God deals with you and you recommit your life. There have been a lot of moments in my life where I've said, okay. Okay, Lord, I, you win. I, I give in again to do what I know I need to do, what I know I, I need to buckle down and be committed to, because I, you know, I lost it. There are times when, as a dad, you've got to say, I'm sorry. I, you know, I've, I really failed. Could you forgive me? Would you forgive me? Could we try again? Those are, those are moments that literally changed the direction of the future. 
And I, I just wonder this morning if we couldn't have a time. Revival comes when men gather their families together and really pray and recommit ourselves. Well, what, could we just bow our heads for just a moment? Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want us to stand all over the audience. Would you stand while our heads are bowed? And I'm going to ask you to do something this morning, dads. You came and got in a choir. I'm going to ask you, would you grab your wife? Would you, if your kids are with you, grab your kids. Would you just come and let's just, we've got a big altar here. We've got the front pews here. Could we just come and just say, God, I want to, I want to lead my family anew. I want to, I want to restart here. I want to, I want to be the dad that leads, and I know I, I can do better. I know I can recommit. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Father, I pray you'll help us today that dads will, will take the lead and will come and recommit and renew, Lord, their desire to lead their families and to take initiative and to see the physical needs, the spiritual needs, the emotional needs of their family. Oh, God. Help us today. Send a revival in our families that could result in a revival in our church and a revival in our, our community and a revival in our country. God, we need you. More than anything else, Jairus begged, Jesus, come to my home. May we, may we pray that prayer, Jesus, be the first one in our home, the priority in our home. Let's pray. Let's